Hello, my name is Cindy Barker, and what I'm doing today is recapping for uh, a permanent record the classes that we just taught in July, or excuse me, June 2020. <laughs> and so, see, once I record, I'm, I go all crazy. So this was a series of sessions that we had for the Pea Patch Gardeners, and it was explaining to them Hub 101. What is a hub um, and why pea patchers might be interested in advancing their locations, which are also community hubs, into something a little more active. And so this presentation will go through what we went in all three sessions, and I will try and integrate some of the questions some of the gardeners on the earlier sessions asked. So my name is Cindy Barker, and my uh, partner in doing this was Ann Forrest. And uh, I work mostly in the south and central part of Seattle, and Ann covers sort of north of the Ship Canal. So we have two focals who can help answer questions throughout the city. So what we're gonna go ahead and do is go through this. It'll take less than an hour. And so I appreciate you coming and learning about the hubs this way. So we're gonna cover three main things. Um, one is just the overview of what the hubs are, and then we'll cover how the hubs operate. And then we'll have a little discussion about the pea patch locations and what's unique about those. So the, the, at, at its simplest, what a hub is, it's a, it's a community gathering place where it's been pre-named so that after a disaster, if people need help or information, they have a place to come when all normal communication is cut off. So we generally tend to think about this as being the big earthquake that's gonna happen and internet's gonna go down, cell services will be overwhelmed. And so people are gonna wanna know what's going on, or they may want to offer to help, and they have a local place where they can come do that. Um, the, the COVID pandemic that we've got going on right now, the hubs would not have stood up because you can, you know, first, because it's a pandemic, but you can stay at your home and get the information you need. So this is really for the big all communications out disasters. And so what the intention is to do is share that information, match people who need something with someone who has it, or a skill that someone uh, is able to offer to the community. The reason why we do that in the community is because we're not the government agency. So we're not, we're not affiliated directly with the city of Seattle. We work with them because they're an important agency for information, but we're independent volunteers. And part of the reason for that is in the community, we people are going to want to know what's going on right afterwards and it's going to take uh the city of seattle as large as it is is a little bit of time to figure out what happened get the situation awareness prioritize where they need to do their response and to actually get boots on the ground out into the neighborhoods and so you depending on what kind of neighborhood you live in and what disaster damage has happened you might not see a responder for multiple days and so Community level response is really essential to be able to get people right back up and get their needs uh, met. So we're not that government agency, but we're all neighbors trying to help each other. We're not a shelter site. So most of our hubs are in parks or parking lots or in church parking lots. So we're not guaranteed to be a shelter site, but that is part one of our roles is to help people find what shelters have opened. We're not gonna be a medic station none of us are necessarily trained nurses or doctors but again we would try and match up with how can you get to the nearest hospital is the nearest hospital even open uh, what about urgent care clinics you know who's opened up you know what's going on that you can get that information but we don't do that at the physician and we're definitely not the place where we've been cashing food and water for the neighborhood that's just not a good practice. That stuff ages out, it's expensive, and you'd need a huge, a huge storage area because we have 600 to 800,000 people in the city of Seattle right now. So we, again, we're gonna have to figure out where is the food or supplies rather than have it pre-staged. So I'm gonna show a series of things to talk over some of those aspects of it, and I put in a lot of pictures. Every year the hubs go out in the field and do an exercise. And we've been doing this for about 10 years now. And so uh, not all hubs set up every year, but you know, there's usually 15 or so that 
that participate in our annual drill and they set up and they practice. We write scripts for citizen actors to come and you have people come to the hub and act as though they're those people who have something, need something, or want to share some information. And we put the hub to the test. You know, how will you handle this? How will you not lose a person? How will you get the information displayed? So this is what this series of pictures is going to show you. Because the main commodity is information, you know, we spend a lot of time practicing sending information into the hub and displaying it. So these are the multiple ways that information gets displayed on whiteboards. Um, you put sheet page holders up and you, you know, put in forms of where shelters might be is the example we've got on the right hand side. You can mark up maps to show, you know, is there a bridge open or closed? You know, is this road damaged and has debris go around to get to the hospital? That type of information. Um, in many of our communities, we have all sorts of different dimensions to our different communities. And so uh, we're gonna have people who speak different languages. And so we have several tools that we've created to, to give to each hub. And one of them is this kind of universal communication card so that even if I don't speak someone's language, I might be able to find out that what they're looking for is a firefighter or what they're looking for is hospital information so that we can help people until we can get interpret volunteer interpreters to be at the hub and help. And so this is, again is showing just the difference in the way the different hubs operate. These are ham radio operators down in the lower right hand corner and I'll talk more about those at a later slide. Um, a couple of examples. For example, my hub is in Morgan Junction, which is in West Seattle. And I'm in a park that has no walls. You know, it's just me in the park and a shelter tent. And so what we had developed is uh, what you see in the bottom, a, a sheet that we just taped some plastic to so that we could make pockets. But if you're lucky enough to be next door to something, this is the hub up at High, uh, High Point and they have a wall and an overhang. So if it's raining, they've got some protection and they can just tape stuff straight to the wall to organize the information. And this is kind of the kind of things that we're doing. Who needs something, who has something, and what is the bulletin information that's coming out? And there is no one size fits all. I mean, this is the one lesson we learned. We can tell people kind of best practices and show you all the tools we've developed, but your hub may be in a very high density, uh, high rise neighborhood. And so the focus might be on all the people who might be afraid to go back in their buildings and you're gonna have a lot of sheltering you might be requested to find. Or you might be way out in the fringes in a very low density single family neighborhood and everybody's houses are okay. And there's not much you know, concern and your focus ends up being information or maybe sharing and helping other hubs that are more affected in your neighborhood. Uh, you can have radio operators or not. We figured out um, a way for you, even if you don't have an active ham radio operator who could broadcast stuff for you, you can listen to the radio. And so we'll teach you how you can listen to the radios that the city is using to transfer information and get additional information. Because if you're trying to listen to King or Cairo for Puget Sound information, you may not be getting the information directly local for what you need. We'll give you, we'll show you the forms, we'll show you that flow of a hub, but if you don't have enough volunteers or you have something additional you want to add, you know, do it. And then the last piece is there's differences in populations around the hubs and, and we've done, we've shared some tools, online tools, hub captains can use to find out what's, what's your population around your hub like? Do you have a lot of senior citizens? Do you have a lot of, um, medically dependent um, population. What are the languages around your hub? So knowing who might show up is part of being prepared so that you're not surprised when um, something shows up and you went, I never even thought about getting ready for that. So populations and knowing your neighborhood is a good thing. And we'll talk about the partnerships that can help you learn that. So that's the overview of the hub. That's the, the mission of the hub, how we would stand up, kind of the things we've thought through. So now we're gonna talk about the actual area of the hubs, the different actual pieces that people plug into and how that flows and the volunteers who run those areas. The, the key thing to say is a hub is not about the stuff at the hub. A hub is the people who are running the hub, 
the knowledge of the people at the hub, how plugged in they are to what's around them in their local neighborhood, and it's not a bunch of gear. So we do have a list of stuff that would be helpful to have. And for example, at my hub, I've got a table, a couple of chairs. I don't even have a pop-up shelter. I'm gonna be asking someone from the neighborhood to bring me a tarp, but it's mostly writing material. It's those whiteboards, it's the pens, and it's the forms so that people can communicate and, and um, share the information or share their requirements. You could do that with a stack of post-its if you had to, but forms just make it a little bit easier to keep the data organized. This is what we're gonna talk about. So this is a hub where everything is, you know, it's on the backstop of a baseball field and they've got everything really linear and you could see all the little elements that we're gonna talk about here next. So this is um, a depiction of, so while that was linear, I think of a hub as kind of a U. You've got two sides to the hub. One is around the information. Uh, what is it people have come to look for? And the other is around the action where we're trying to actively match someone with a need or a resource or a skill. So each of these positions has got a person that we've sort of written a role for. And as I go through each of these areas, I'll talk about what the area does and what the person at that position would do. So the first area that we would expect people to come into at a hub is called the self-help and education area. And now, if somebody comes up and says, my wife just went into labor, I need a medical person, we'll talk about how they go, they don't have to go through the whole thing to get there. But if people come up and they're just like, hey, I'm okay, but I think I'm gonna run out of water, or I'm not sure you know, how I'm gonna heat my house, this help, self-help education will keep them uh, give them the information they need without having to talk to a bunch of people. And we have one person who's sitting there who can help go, oh, you're trying to figure out how to sterilize water. Well, it's this poster over here. And so it is um, really geared to have the neighbors help each other. You know, if, if they don't need specific help, then this whole area can be done for information exchange. So we created five posters to put up because in, in stress, People don't remember things. They don't, you know, you just sometimes don't think right. And so, for example, if uh, somebody said, if the city has issued a boil water and I don't have uh, heat, gas, my gas has been cut off, and I'm going to go, well, how do I boil my water? Is there some other way to sterilize it, sanitize it? Well, yes, there is, but I'm not going to remember how many drops of bleach I put in a gallon of water. I won't even a clue and won't be able to look it up on my cell phone. So the poster is to help us remember some of those essential things that will help people get through for the several days until the city tells us what the bigger response is going to be. So there's water, there's food, there's a, there's a lot of people who aren't used to cooking anymore and uh, they're going to be wondering what to do with the whole freezer food, you know, freezer that is starting to defrost of all their, you know, stash of food. So just food safety is critical. We don't need people getting sick from eating um, food that had got spoiled. And then the three other posters are around the hazards, you know, reminding people how, if you smell gas, how to turn off your gas supply, what damage buildings might look like where you wanna be careful not to go back into something that's got a certain significant damage. The middle poster is all around you know, right after a disaster, human nature continues to work and several hours later, people are gonna be going, well, now what do I do? Because my toilet's not flushing. So we have the quick how to build a portable toilet and how to safely dispose of human waste so that again, we don't have the problem of contamination and spreading disease. And then the last one is just reminders about how to do communications, you know, put your cell phone on airplane so it's not endlessly searching for a cell that isn't there anymore and depleting your battery. And, and they're down at the corner on the I am safe tools. Once internet gets reestablished, there are several um, tools that are put out by the Red Cross and Facebook and Google so that you can remember to go tell your family that you're okay because everybody's worried about someone who might've been in that disaster zone. So from that self-help area, which is just, you know, oh, and, and the one thing I forgot to say is you have an educator there and we, Anne had created a, a whole series of books, and one of the books is around education tips. You know, so anything that's not on the poster that we thought could be applicable in a disaster is in the book. And so if somebody has some specific question, 
you know, we might have the inf information already there at your hub. The second area that's in um, kind of that information side is just bulletins. What is, what is the information that's coming from neighbors who are telling you the local conditions like, is the grocery store open yet? Um, oh, it's open, but they're taking cash only. You can't get on to I-5 from here. You've got to go down this way. I in West Seattle am going, well, I guess I'm, is the bridge up? Am I going to any hospitals downtown or am I going to Highline Hospital down south? So it's that information that is critical for the neighborhood and the citizens to go, am I supposed to go to work tomorrow? When, you know, have we heard when school's going to open? Have the schools all gotten all the students out? What's going on? So you can see that each of these is, you need good writing. That's you know, number one for the person at this position. But because we get this information in a continuous flow, it, it also gets updated. A bridge that might be open one hour could be closed the next hour. So you have someone who is actually putting timestamps onto it so that you can always keep your information up to date and they monitor it, make sure old outdated information is removed. Um, the other element that you can use is maps that help actually, you know, show where bridges are closed or what's uh, open, you know, information. So we have some of these laminated uh, hub, um, hub, excuse me, city maps to distribute to hubs that decide to go active too. And then the last part that is over on the information side is the, a place for the community to post its own messages. You know, we could put up the lost and found, but it's going to be faster and, and more detailed if a person can go up and write, you know, I've lost my dog, please keep a lookout for this Irish setter. Or they're leaving messages to each other, or they're doing something that's spontaneous that they want to get up for everybody's awareness. The hub does not have to be, you know, touch every, every message. It's better to have a place where the community can actually talk to it, talk to itself while you focus on the life, more life-saving elements of it. So you can do it on a whiteboard. This hub, it put up a big tarp so that people could tape stuff to it. This one set up like those old shoe, shoe organizers and they just use those pockets to put the messages in. So that was the information side. So now we're gonna switch over to kind of the action side. And this was the really the bigger intent of the hub originally is if I have um, a case of water that my family doesn't need, is there somebody who needs the water? And oh yes, there is, you know, we're sheltering people up at the Church of the Nazarene, why don't you take the case of water up there? So it's around these four topics, you know, food and water, the resources that people might be wanting to help each other with, sh places for shelter, and then medical skills and medical things too, you know, it goes both ways. So we, we, like I said, we're not shelter locations, but in your neighborhood, you should have thought about, you know, do you have any churches who could act as shelters? And it's really, where can you get people out of the, out of the rain? I have a CrossFit gym in my neighborhood, big floor space. They can be a shelter in a disaster. Bowling alleys, fantastic shelters in a disaster. So you start looking at your neighborhood a little bit different, kind of opportunistic and laying out what are your options. And then after the disaster, you know, go see if they're open, go see if they're able and, and then work from that. And resources are, it is amazing what people want to do in a disaster. They want to bring what they can to help or bring themselves with their chainsaw to help. So it's that way of organizing the match of who's got something, who needs something, and posting it so it makes it easy to sort. So this is what that looks like. Again, it's, you know, again, it's the tape it to the wall, have a pocket protector system. You can see the sign so that one side is on resources. It's I need these resources and the other is I have these resources. So a person would come up to the hub and go, I need a chainsaw. And we'd go, Go look over in the resource thing and see if anybody has offered that chainsaw. If there, ha if there is, the information organizer will get you connected with that person with their contact information. Here's one where people in the bottom, they just took a manila folders and taped the edges together and used that to hold things. So it's not a big elaborate system. It's just what, doing what you can with what you have. The other part of the that side of action is the volunteers. So 
we have seen in many of the earthquakes that we actually do we follow after an earthquake happens to see how did the how did the neighborhood respond sandy is one um, and the big earthquake in uh, christchurch is another one that we really studied to see what do people do and people show up to help they want to do something and so this example is a list of things that we have in the hub captain book that says if you've got five people standing around you wanting to do something and your hub is fully staffed then send them out to go find out which grocery stores are open you know if you know that you've got three grocery stores and that's much easier to say here's three places i want you to go check go do that and come back and tell us what the status is instead of saying I have no idea what's around me, go find out. You know, you give them some, some, something very specific and then you actually get results that way. And you can use them to help organize things. And one of the things we find is that people will say, well, I'm here, I don't know what I can do, but I wanna help. Well, it only takes a few questions about what they did in their job or what they did at, at home that you find out they have a hobby that is fantastic or they were a logistics person at their work and they're organizers and they just don't know to articulate that. And I, and I got to tell you, every, almost everybody can cook. So if you've got a shelter going and they're feeding people, you send them up there to do the cooking. So there's a way to do that. And, and you have a, a volunteer coordinator who is you know, receiving the people in and assigning them out as the needs come up. For the community, that's where you're sending people out. If you have people who are in the trades like um, carpenters and anybody who can help with stabilizing or you know, uh, putting a tarp up over a roof real quick because a tree fell onto someone's roof and they just gotta you know, tarp it off so that they can stay in their house you know, because it's perfectly fine except for the rain dripping in, those are the people you're looking for. Um, anybody with medical skills, we, we, are really worried about you know getting to hospitals in the parts of Seattle that are not convenient and nearby Pill Hill or Ballard's got a hospital of children's for example West Seattle it's 20 miles to the one at Highline so having people who are medical know to come to your hub to help is really really important um, we get questions about well why don't you have lists of who your doctors are this is really it's really hard to not do that because it, the, the recommendation is you could but then you'd be going and looking for people who might have not been at home when the disaster happened out of town they may have even moved they've retired you know so it's more the messaging is more if you have a skill come to the hub rather than have to go chase people only to find out you've wasted your time translators is another a skill that people tend not to think about, but if you have a, a multi-language area, you're gonna want people who are translators to be able to come. And that's often where second generation uh, kids can really, really help. And then that kind of leads right into scouts. The kids are helpful. It helps a little bit distress them if you can give them jobs that puts them to work and makes them useful. Um, the picture down at the bottom with the kids on the radio there was a Boy Scout troop who ran the radio um, activity at the Queen Anne hub for about five or six years until most of them aged out and the parent who was interested in ham radio left too. But they were really good. They were interested. They felt like they were used in contributing. Scouts, Girl Scouts, all those youth groups are really good around that. And so just to reiterate, everybody's got a skill they use. If somebody has come to the hub and said, I'm here, just I just wanted to see what's going on, you know, latch on to them and say, well, what can you do? Because you're going to have needs for that. And this is, this is this particular slide. This is around staffing the hub. So as I walked around the hub and talked about all those different people organizing that, that's like about nine people if you have everything fully up and running and staffed. It's a lot, but what we made was so that you could take any person off the street and say, here, I'm going to give you the, the two page training manual here, this is the three important things you should do at this hub. And then you help bring them on and volunteer at the hub right then. It's great if you can have a session like this ahead of time where you get to practice. But if you have to put in volunteers into place, we do this during the drill. We actually practice a shift change where we go grab someone and say, 
we need to practice our transition to next shift. Would you pretend you're going to be the greeter at the next uh, shift and let us train you? And so the way you do that is they watch you for a couple of times, then you switch over and they do it for a couple of times while you watch them. So you get a little bit of that transition. So we have a quick start guide that's for the hub manager, which kind of takes you through everything I just went through. It's nine pages of pictures of how to set up your hub. There's a full up hub book with a lot more checklists and information about sheltering and other stuff like that. And like I said, each one of the roles has this book that you can hand someone and say, here's, here's your key information for doing this job. The two roles I didn't talk about that were on the picture at the beginning are, um, they're kind of like the admin roles. One is a greeter, and the greeter is the entry point. You try and make your entry point of your hub be real visible so that people go there, and the greeter is the one saying, well, what are you here for? And getting them to the right part of the hub so that they get what they need, what, what they came for the quickest they can. It's sort of like a triage system. And the greeter is the person where if somebody says, well, I don't know, I just, you know, we're all okay on our block. And I was just curious, so I came up there and you could say, well, go look at the bulletins, write down anything you need to take back to your, to your block, but then can you, you know, come back and do something for us? Can you have your neighbors come up and do the next shift? So the greeter is the person who's trying to, you know, get people efficiently and also doing so, some of the recruiting. The second role is the message taker, and that's the person who, when you have a form to fill out, um, we have found in drill after drill after drill that people's handwriting is horrible. So you need a message taker who's either filling the form out, but if you do that, you have bottlenecks forming. So they usually have people fill out the forms and then they look at it so that they can make sure they filled out everything, we know how to contact them, or we know when they're gonna come back to look for something, and that you can read it so, when they walk away, if you can't read anything, you've lost it. It's just a useless piece of paper then. So that's the whole system of the hub. That's um, how everything all works together. The, the one area that um, I'm not going to talk much more about other than what's on this slide is the radio connections. So the city of Seattle has a volunteer team called the Auxiliary Communication Service and they're ham radio operators who are registered in the emergency worker program and they serve at the pleasure of the city, and the city will assign them either to fire stations, to the downtown emergency operations center. They may be assigned to field positions out in the city, but they are our lifeline of communication if we're able to have ham radio communications about what is the city trying to send out that maybe we're not hearing through Cairo Como. Because the city will send that type of information out, but they don't have to read it. So this gives us a chance to get the bulletin information directly from the city so that we can put it up for everybody about life safety issues, um, sheltering, whatever the city's gotten going. There's a possibility that the city may ask for information from the hubs. And so the radio acts as that kind of communication. We know that there's gonna be so much radio traffic. It's not like we're gonna say, there, we have one person injured, when will you send someone to help? It's more like the difference of, I have hundreds of people injured versus we have some injuries and we have local medical taking care of it. That's the level the city needs to know of. So those volunteers may or may not be at your hub. We have, like I said, we have the ability for you to monitor what's being said on, on the radio. You may have ham radio operators, local people who just appear, who weren't part of the team, but they know how to run a ham radio operator. We've written some information so that they can plug in and at least be useful. And then if you don't have any radio operators, but you know in West Seattle, let's say half of our hubs have radio operators on the day of a disaster, and I'm one that doesn't, I'm gonna assign someone, called it's called a sneaker net, to go over to that next hub every hour and find out what bulletin information has come in and come back and get it up on our whiteboard. So, there's ways to work around not having a, a, a ham radio operator who's active with your hub. The forms I talked about are, you know, every time people, every time we do a drill, we find flaws or ways to improve our forms. And so what you see in front of you is three versions of the, of the forms that we've used. And we really basically say, pick one that appeals to you and, and 
So some, like the middle one, a lot of people have started um, migrating over to this half page one, but it's all to capture, you know, the basics of information, who, what, when, where. We're not, we don't kind of care much about how, but if you don't have the who, what, when, where, the form is not very helpful. But you could, without the forms, do it on a piece of paper or a post-it. And the joke is this is called FEMA form number one. You just get a blank piece of paper out and you start filling out the who, what, when, where. So that's how the hubs operate. So what, what we transition to here is P patches are unique and the community they're in is also slightly unique. And so you get two things to think about as we go into this next part. So I kind of made a list and I think I covered everything in here. I've covered almost everything that I got asked during the three sessions. I'll expand on a couple of them because there was a couple of few questions around integration into the neighborhoods. But um, a, a concern for some pea patches is their gardeners are actually not living around the neighborhood. They drive in and that's just the nature of the pea patch program. If you have a, an apartment on Capitol Hill and the pea patches up there are full, those folks may be willing to drive to some other location to do their pea patching. Sometimes the pea patches are not the best gathering place. We know of a couple on a steep slope. Some pea patches are not near business centers. You know, uh, my closest pea patch down in Morgan is kind of far away from our little business area. And so they may not necessarily have good connections, but there's ways to establish that. We'll talk about how to get around that. And then the high potential for the multiple languages and multiple cultures. So one of the key things around thinking through these uniquenesses is all drawback, we all have drawbacks at our hubs. They're all different things and we have to think about how we do this. When I think about the gardeners who are not living around your hub, if you are talking about preparedness and you're talking about what you would do at the hub, they're still learning. What they can then take back is to their family and help their family get prepared because no matter where you are in a disaster, you can help. And so I, I may be shopping in Northgate and the disaster happens and if I can't get home, I'm probably just gonna go to the nearby hub because I'm not gonna waste my time trying to get home for a day or two. I'll go help where I'm at. And so the more we can help individuals and families be prepared, the more people can be resilient. They don't even have to come to a hub, you know, and that helps you because then you don't have more victims coming. They're prepared, they can stay at home, or maybe they can show up as volunteers wherever they're at. If, if your location at your hub is not super great, like the, we just walked the maple leaf pea patch not too long ago, and it's, it's pretty sloped and they don't have a very good gathering space, but right next to them, well, they have their driveway, that's one place, and then right next to them is a parking lot for an apartment building, and that would be a perfect place. So you just put a sign up and say, we're right next door. They have part of the street, it's not a busy through street that they could use. So, so there is ways to work around some of the issues that are around um, the geographic problems. And you can also, we've had a couple places where a hub has been set up and the pea patch is really like within a block or two, you can actually just form a partnership with the active hub, practice with them. And so when there's a disaster, you put a sign up at your hub that says, you know, walk the block over to where we all are in the more active, better located hub. So that's always an option. The third one down, which is whether you may or may not have existing connection with businesses. And this is where we got a lot of the questions during the session. We learned COVID was, it's, it's around the social capital that we all have in our neighborhoods to help each other, no matter what the situation. And so the more connections you make, the better you are. Um, the Morgan Hub that I was saying, the Morgan Hub and the Morgan Pea Patch there, quite separated, but because the Morgan Pea Patch was started by the Morgan Community Association, which also sponsors the hub, those two are actually kind of connected and we can help, help them with connections into what's in the business district. So the other thing I've learned about your Pea Patch programs is that you guys have your food donation programs. You've already made partnerships that way. You do free farm stand events. 
those are all great times when you are doing one of your events is to put your A-frames that all of you should have gotten or picked up. And if you haven't picked them up, call Julie Bryant because she's got a few, because she says some hubs hadn't picked those up yet, or some P-patches hadn't picked them up. But you could put that out and it's a conversation starter for all the people who do walk by. You know, we have a lot of people walking these days who walk by and your gardeners can just take a few minutes and tell them what it is you're doing and how, what, you know, what role or what aspect you're adopting as part of the P-Patch to Hub program. And then the last thing is many of you already have translators. You know people who can do translation because that happens in your garden already. And so it's really keeping, keeping them informed of what you're trying to do and make sure that they can be enlisted into helping in a disaster as well. There's some side, effects, side benefits around that connection that I was talking about. Like if, if you have people who are now interested because it's something that they can participate in as opposed to all those plots are taken and they're just enjoying the flowers that you're growing, that connection where, oh, I could come to this hub and I have a role and maybe I could practice here, gets you more eyes on your garden and people who are gonna be able to look out for, hey, why is, I didn't recognize that going on in the garden. What's going on? So it's a little bit of a safety and security benefit for you. And just the fact that people are saying, what is, why are you thinking about disaster preparedness? Just starting that conversation for people who may not know they live in earthquake country is a good thing because that at least starts them on the awareness of what we're trying to promote with having more resilient communities. So you can really launch that conversation for us. So the next steps that we would normally talk about um, is if, if we were doing this in real person, we would have stopped for a little while and done a little role playing. We would have assigned roles and we'd walked around and said, okay, this person is here and they want to do this, where would you send them? So you kind of learn how it works a little bit more. So because we're just not able to do that, this during COVID, you know, I'd be happy to come out and do this with your hub, you know, with any of your, excuse me, with any of your key patches, so that if you're interested and you're looking for someone to lead this in your group and you want your whole group to be aware of it, we'll come back out and do this. This video could help, but it's much more interesting and fun to, you know, do it in person. So we'll do any kind of training you need. We can do additional coaching. We do mentoring. We have a network of hubs. So the pea patch gardens are place gatherings right now until you start making them more active and practicing. And so for all the hubs that came up through the, you know, volunteers came and said, we wanna put a hub in our community. How do we do that? We have a network of support. And so we meet every other month, although we've been meeting monthly during COVID, we meet every other month to talk about uh, the hub in the box program or what new tools are we developing or um, ideas for getting information out to, to groups and uh, messaging. And so that's where then at the end of the meeting, we spend a good part of it going around to each hub going, what are you doing and what help do you need? So it's really the hub captains helping each other. So that's, that's kind of a, a key thing and you can plug into that just to learn you know, what other hubs are doing. And then as I mentioned, as I went through this, um, there were all those signage, there's the maps, there, there's the hub books. Those are all the tools that you can use to grow your hub and we can get them to you if you have gotten your group together and said, yes, we wanna be a hub and we wanna start working on that. Um, this is the contact information. So we have a website and we have an email. And so the info at seattleemergencyhub.org, uh, if you send an email, we'll respond to you and start working with you that way. You can sign up for our quarterly newsletters at our website. You know, it's got one of those widgets that says, I wanna learn, I wanna stay on the mailing list. And then uh, that tells you what we're up to generally, the activities and tools that we're developing. And the other thing that's on that website is there's a link or tab called the neighbor link map. And if you go to that tab, it's got all the hubs in the city of Seattle, along with all the block watch groups and snap groups that have registered with us. 
but you can go to a hub and, and down here at the bottom is what it looks like. If it's an active practicing hub, it's, it's the darker icon. If it's just a, a place, you know, a pea patch type place hub that's been designated as a community gathering place, it's this lighter one. So the person at this garden could come and go, okay, well, I'm going to click on the practicing hub and find out who that is. It gives you the name of the hub, the location, the hub captain's name, and their contact information. So you can actually start to work with each other. You know, this is a case where they might say, well, let's just, you know, all work here together. And then I can tell you, this is a big ridge down here. So these two aren't probably going to work together because that's a real geographic slope. So that's what's useful, though, is you can go see what hubs are around you and who, how to plug in with those. So that was kind of the, well, the video version is what you're watching here. This was from our last presentation. That was kind of the high flyover of Hub 101 for Pea Patch Gardeners. I thank you for your attention and uh, please contact us if you want to move forward. Thank you.